Who was Faramir, and what made him so special in Tolkien's Legendarium? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. On this channel we cover the best in fantasy books and TV shows. The Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire, The Witcher, and much more. If that sounds good, there's a subscribe button appearing now in the bottom right of your screen. Faramir is introduced by Boromir in The Lord of the Rings at the Council of Elrond, simply as Boromir's nameless brother. So when Frodo and we finally meet him in the Two Towers, that's all we have to go on. Frodo's last experience of Boromir was of him succumbing to the Ring and trying to take it from Frodo, so that's what we're expecting from his brother. But that's not what Tolkien did. Faramir is a very different person. So who was he? Faramir was born in the year 2983 of the Third Age to Denethor and Finduilas, five years after the birth of Boromir. Like his father, but unlike his brother, Gandalf described Faramir as a man in whom the blood of Numenor ran nearly true. As one in the line of the stewards, Faramir traced his lineage back to Hurin of Emin Arnen, the first steward of Gondor and a kinsman of King Minardil. His mother, Finduilas, was the sister of Imrahil. Like the prince, she could trace her descent down from the elf maid Mithrelas, one of the companions of Nimrodel. As such, Faramir had a very small strain of elvish blood on his mother's side, so a high heritage. At which point, we should probably introduce one of the most intriguing parts of Faramir's character, his similarity to Tolkien himself. Like Tolkien, Faramir lost his mother at a very early age, with Faramir being just five when she passed, and Tolkien twelve. Without wanting to get too far ahead of ourselves, there is also a clear similarity in Faramir and Tolkien's love of lore. Much of Tolkien's exposition about the histories of Numenor and Gondor is put directly into Faramir's speech in The Lord of the Rings, and one could easily argue that Tolkien's own views on virtue and nobility find their home in Faramir. Tolkien even said in one of his letters that, as far as any character is like me, it is Faramir. Anyway, an important part of Faramir's inheritance was his respect for his older brother. We read that it did not seem possible to Faramir that anyone in Gondor could rival Boromir, heir of Denethor, captain of the White Tower, and of like mind was Boromir, which says a lot about Boromir as well. But Boromir wasn't the only important figure in Faramir's youth. Gandalf visited Minas Tirith several times while Faramir was young. Faramir learned a lot during these visits, for which Denethor later derided his son as a wizard's pupil. Gandalf even revealed to Faramir that his name in Valinor was Lorin, something very few other mortals knew. Although we don't get to meet Faramir until the Two Towers, his involvement in the War of the Rings started much earlier, when on June the 19th of 3018, he first began to have a recurring dream. Boromir described it to the Council of Elrond. A dream came to my brother in a troubled sleep, and afterwards a like dream came off to him again, and once to me. In that dream, I thought the eastern sky grew dark, and there was out of it a growing thunder. But in the west, a pale light lingered, and out of it I heard a voice. We know what comes next. Seeking for the sword that was broken, Imladris, the halfling standing forth, and so on. But it's noticeable that for as much lore as he had learned, Faramir did not know about Imladris. It was only by bringing the words to his father that he and Boromir learned of Rivendell. This certainly speaks to the estrangement of elves and men by the end of the Third Age, that the heirs to the rule of Gondor had no knowledge whatsoever of Rivendell. The day after he had his first dream, Faramir fought alongside his brother Boromir when Sauron suddenly attacked Osgiliath. The forces of Gondor were numerically outmatched, but might have prevailed if not for the nine Nazgul. Their presence set fear in the hearts of even the men of Gondor. The Nazgul drove the Gondorians out of East Osgiliath, with Boromir and Faramir defending the last bridge until it was destroyed, after which they, and only two others, were able to swim to the western shore. The dream came several more times to Faramir, and it seems likely that he was the Valar's intended emissary to Elrond, but Boromir, being both the elder brother and the more forceful personality, used his prerogative to take the quest himself. We can only speculate what would have happened had Faramir rather than Boromir gone to Rivendell. 
Doubtless he would have been made a member of the Fellowship, and given what we learn later, he may have resisted the temptation of the Ring for longer than Boromir. We'll come back to that idea a bit later. Because on February the 26th of 3019, Faramir and Denethor heard Boromir blowing the Great Horn as the Fellowship was attacked by orcs. There was clearly some magic going on here, as Faramir was hundreds of miles away, but it's probably more than just coincidental that Faramir was in Osgiliath, on the banks of the Anduin, when Boromir's funerary boat passed by. That time Faramir mistook the boat as a vision and did not touch it, which then passed down the Anduin to the sea. Following that, Faramir went into Ithilien, where he took command of the rangers there. It was with them during a raid on Eastlings passing through northern Ithilien that Faramir and his company came across to Frodo and Sam. The Tolkien scholar Tom Shippey sees in this scene a parallel with Eomir's encounter with Aragorn. In both meetings in the wilderness, the war captains had charges to kill or capture any trespassers into their land, but exercised their own judgment in letting the travellers go. But Faramir comes out very well in this comparison, showing arguably more shrewdness, often guessing at what is left unsaid. And when the subject of the One Ring comes up, he simply says that, I would not take this thing if it lay by the highway. Not were Minas Tirith falling in ruin, and I alone could save her, so using this weapon of the Dark Lord for her good and my glory. Clearly, his heart is good, and when in reflective mood Faramir tells Frodo what his heart's desire is, it is that I would see the white tree flower again in the courts of the kings, and the silver crown return, and Minas Tirith in peace, Minas Anor again as of old, full of light, high and fair, beautiful as a queen among queens. War must be, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour us all, but I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. Faramir does not want the glory for himself, or even put his own desires first. He wants what is best for the land and the people. At which point, let's briefly come back to that question about whether Faramir would have done a better job than his brother in resisting the lure of the ring. Because, based on what we know of both of them, Surely he would. The ring played on a lust for power, and Faramir seems to have a lot less of that than his brother did. But we do have to recognise that the circumstances of the two brothers' interactions with the ring were vastly different. Boromir had travelled with Frodo in the ring for two months, whereas Faramir had only held Frodo captive overnight. Faramir's wisdom was in sending the ring far from his reach, that was not in Boromir's power to do while the company remained intact, and by the time that he was prepared to depart from the Fellowship and go with Aragorn to Minas Tirith, the ring had a hold on him. At best, the company might have still broken at Amon Hen, with the hobbits crossing the Anduin and Faramir and the others going to Gondor. Perhaps that was what the Valar intended. Perhaps. Or perhaps the greater providence was in turning Boromir's fall into the catalyst for Frodo and Sam to go on alone. In any event, it's hard not to imagine that if Faramir did make it to Mordor with Frodo, the power of the ring would wax strongly on him as it drew closer to the locus of Sauron's might, working on him the whole time. Would he have been able to stay as faithful as Sam to the very end? We'll never know. One thing Faramir does have in his favour, though, is hope. This is in clear contrast to his brother, who seems to see hope only in strength of arms, and his father who loses all hope in the end. Not that Faramir had any more cause for hope than his father or brother. He had faced the vanguard of Sauron's army and retreated with devastating losses against the might of the Nazgul. When he met and questioned Frodo, he knew how perilous the path it was that he took. But he still had hope. This is the elvish concept of Estelle, Hope based not just in the expectation of a good outcome, because you think something will happen, but rather a trust in a greater power at work in the world. Faramir was a man of Estelle, and perhaps this is what prompted Gandalf to be so open with him when they met when Faramir was a boy, telling him his real name. He must have seen something in Faramir. 
And perhaps also it is this unshakable faith in the power of providence that helps make Faramir the character most like Tolkien. Tolkien, of course, even invented a word, eucatastrophe, to express that moment when providence intervenes to save our heroes from a terrible fate, when the eagles arrive, for example. Interestingly, when Pippin finally meets Faramir, he compared him not to Denethor or even Boromir primarily, but to Aragorn. Here was one with an air of high nobility, such as Aragorn at times revealed, less high perhaps, yet also less incalculable and remote, one of the kings of men born into a later time but touched with the wisdom and sadness of the elder race. This was similar to Eowyn's assessment while they both recovered in the House of Healing. She too compared him with Aragorn, regarding Faramir as less high and noble, but unlike Pippin, she held this against Faramir. Even as he was clearly courting her, she initially placed him firmly in the friend zone, though she clearly softened later. Following his discharge from the House of Healing, Faramir took up his office as the last ruling steward of Gondor, but his reign lasted only a few weeks, at which time he performed the highest duty entrusted to his office, which was to cede rule back to the rightful king. After the war, Faramir and Eowyn were wed in Meduseld. This marriage of King Eomer's sister to the steward of Gondor renewed and strengthened the ancient bonds between the two realms. Afterwards, the newlyweds removed to Ithilien. Legolas later brought elves out of the Greenwood to live within its borders, surely an honour for Faramir, who was in awe of the elves, but had had little concourse with them previously. We're told that together, Faramir and Eowyn dwelt in a fair new house in the hills of Emin Arnen, whose gardens devised by the elf Legolas were renowned. Under Faramir, Ithilien became, once again, the fairest country in all the Westlands. As its March Warden, Faramir cleared Athelion of the servants of Sauron. Aragorn laid on him the charge that Minas Morgul was to be utterly destroyed. Moreover, during expeditions to the east, Faramir and Imrahil were the king's chief commanders, and when Aragorn was away from the south, Faramir, as steward, would govern Gondor in the king's name. During those days, the white tree flowered again. The silver crown returned, worn by one worthy of it, and though much fighting continued long after the war ended, it was not for the glory of battle, but in service of the thing's war defence. Through it came a long peace that recalled, for a time, Numenor of old. In the end, Faramir's valour and hope were rewarded with everything that he had wanted. If you'd like to see more videos like this on Tolkien's World, then please click on the link on the left of your screen, or to check out my new channel, IDG Live, with new short and long-form content being added all the time, please click the link in the middle of your screen. Thanks for watching. That's all for this time. I'll see you again soon.